Good day. Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. Lots on the go today. As always, plenty of news, man. You know, as it's summertime, I kind of complain a little bit, saying, geez, there's just not enough going on. I miss when Parliament's in session and all that stuff. And then fall hits, and then the hardest part is trying to think about how much stuff I can jam in to rant and rave about over the course of 45 minutes when there's so many subjects to choose from. Either way, i got lots to cover today. My guest is going to be Dr. Michael Wagner. He's been on before. He writes columns for the Western Standard, and he's written a number of books. He's got a new one out uh, called Time to Leave, and yes, it's a Western Independence-themed book. And there's the 18th anniversary of a, another of his books here, Canada Standing on Guard for Thee. We're going to talk about that and a few other things and our, and our differences and views on things. I'm looking forward to that. I really like talking to Michael when I get the chance. So, uh, yes, as I said, it's a, it's a beautiful fall day out there. It's nice, you know. Uh, it looks like horrible weather coming into uh, Florida. There's a hurricane moving in down there. Hopefully it's not as bad as folks are being warned. I wonder who's controlling all that weather that's making this happen. Who on the big weather gods has been fixing it so Alberta's getting nice weather and Florida's getting beaten on? Why? It must be the chemtrails, right? Yeah, I'm going to start on that, guys, because I'm getting sick of it. Look, political gotcha games are one of the favorite tactics the hysteric left likes to use to try and paint conservatives as crazy. One of the best gifts a conservative politician can give an opponent is to appear to embrace fringe conspiracy theories. Now, recently, Alberta Premier Daniel Smith stepped in it when she appeared to lend credence to the long discredited chemtrails theory when she answered a question at a town hall meeting. Smith never said the chemtrail theory had any validity or that people should be concerned, but she answered the questioner as if it was a legitimate question worthy of discourse. She really should have just dismissed it. It was an act of being polite to a person who doubtless was genuinely concerned but it didn't do the Premier of Albertans any favors. The new scroll was taken up for days with legacy media members being aghast. I mean, Andrew Coyne, of course, haughtily said, Premier Loon, he loves saying that about Smith. And of course, they implied that Smith was an adherent to kooky chemtrail theories. The Premier then had to waste time and energy clarifying and explaining where she stood as her comments were taken out of context and they spread like wildfire. So what's the lesson here? It's a simple one. Don't give time to bloody conspiracy theorists. Look, look at the chemtrail thing and think about how unreasonable it is. The chemtrail conspiracy theory assumes that all those jet contrails you see in the sky are actually chemicals being sprayed to control the weather and to poison citizens. For this conspiracy to work, one must assume that every commercial pilot, airline mechanic, baggage handler, and even that pretty flight attendant is in on it, as well as every government in the world. It's completely absurd. It's rather easy to debunk the theory. There's plenty of sources online which lay out in lay terms how water vapor, and that's all it is, from aircraft exhaust, condenses at high elevations in certain conditions. There's plenty of photos from World War II showing contrails as aircraft fought during the Battle of Britain, which kind of debunks those claims that these are a new phenomena. Of course, those pictures might have been edited, right? That 1942 Photoshop. I'm confident that our Air Force veterans of World War II weren't part of any grand conspiracy to modify the weather. If they were, I wish they would have made it a little better for our January days. The ready facts countering chemtrail theories are lost on the adherence of the conspiracy theory, though. To try and debate with them is just to invite a barrage of anecdotes and links to websites that share their odd world view. And they also like moving the goalposts into a discussion of cloud seeding practices, which is something else altogether. No, chemtrails are only one of the many of the conspiracy theories thrilling around. Of course, a, a troublesome and pervasive trend that's emerged lately among conspiracy theorists has been the allegations of organized pedophile rings. They believe that most aspects of the world are run by networks of pedophiles who traffic our children and presumably molest them, even apparently in pizza parlors. It's bizarre and it's repugnant. In Alberta, there's one social media activist with a surprisingly large online following who claims that Alberta Health Services is actually a secret pedophile ring and that news outlets that refuse to report on his nutty allegations are part of the conspiracy. It's more than a little offensive, and I suspect he's going to be facing a nasty, nasty civil action pretty soon if he doesn't shut the hell up. Pedophiles do exist, and they're, re, re, they're disgusting, and they do, so, there are some vile networks that trade in children. They have to be exposed, charged, and incarcerated at all costs. That doesn't mean there's thousands of organized pedophile rings, though. As awful as ped child molesters are, thankfully, they aren't as common as some conspiracy theorists would like uh, us to believe they are, and they tend to be loners. I think part of it's an effort to make their villains appear as odious as possible, or at least you know, to quell questioning of their views. They like to shut down debate by saying things like, oh, so you're okay with pedophile rings. No, but instead of letting them drag you into their perverse discourse with statements like that, what people in politics or outside of politics should do is just disengage and ignore them. There's nothing to be gained in trying to reason with them. A popular saying today is yesterday's conspiracies are today's realities. Not in a couple cases that's true. In most cases, though, yesterday's consp conspiracies remain as goofy and unproven today as they ever were. They just have better websites. 
Just because some historic conspiracy theories have proven to have some merit, it doesn't mean the other conspiracy theories are valid. Since there's hundreds of theories out there, some are going to manage to have some merit to them now and then. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. We have some real issues to deal with, and our politicians can only focus on so many of them at a time. Indulging conspiracy types doesn't pacify them, and it only distracts from serious business. Just ask Conservative Party of BC John, leader John Rusted how much he enjoyed having to deal with the fake issue of 5G telephone networks spreading COVID-19 when he should have been campaigning. Woke activists and legacy media, they won't relent and they're going to keep trying to trap conservative politicians. But why make it easy for them? By dipping into the realm of conspiracy theories. Now, I know I've invited a barrage of emails which will link to favorite conspiracy theory sites. I'm not going to respond to any of them. I'm just going to forward them to my masters among the little lizard people who control the media. That's what's got me going to start things out today. Well, getting outside of the conspiracies, let's get a little more closer to home. And, and Dave, are, are you... Uh, why are you doing this to me? What have I done now? <sighs> Because now I'm going to get emails and email. Look, just to be clear, yes. it's C. Morgan at Western Standard News, right? Yes, dot oh, news, yes. Dot news, I'm yes. sorry. Okay, good. Send your emails there. What's with the dog tag? The dog tag. This is uh, for the bring them home, for the uh, hostages ah. held by Hamas in, in mm. Israel. As they should. Yes, as, as my, my Jewish conspiracy masters nice. told me to wear. How's your football team doing? Oh, God. <laughs> saw, saw a picture of you and... Uh, and Duke the Wonder Dog getting ready for the game on uh, on Sunday, I think it was. That was painful. I, I I gotta admit, as I said, yes, I put that picture up because even Duke was hiding his face. And that, you know, as a Steelers fan, I gotta admit, that was not a good game to watch. It was a terrible game. Dallas sucked, and the Steelers sucked more. Yeah. Uh, I'm still hoping for the best. The season is young, but they stunk. Well, it's not easy <laughs> being a Seahawks fan either. We uh, somehow lost to the Giants on the weekend, and oh, there's Duke. Isn't yeah. he lovely? <laughs> the legs all spread like that. Yeah, and me laying there with a bowl on my belly. Yeah, Jane was kind enough to take that fine picture. What's in the bowl? Uh, nothing at that point. Oh. I think it was a brownie or something. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, my Seahawks have got uh, San Fran tomorrow, so ah. that'll be a tough day. <laughs> so. yeah. Anyways, on to the news. Yes. Uh, right now, our site's leading off with the latest from the Saskatchewan election. Uh, correspondent Chris Oldcorn has the uh, the two major parties' policies on drug uh, uh, decriminalization and uh and uh, safe using sites and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, close to Alberta, we've got the uh, Canadian Taxpayers Federation calling on uh, Premier Smith to join uh, Blaine Higgs, Premier of uh, New Brunswick, in his court challenge against uh, the carbon tax. And uh, Chris Sims with the CTF is, uh, is urging her to do that. Uh, Alberta, the UCP announced today a deal with resident doctors uh, to get them uh, more pay and uh, and uh, hopefully shorter hours. Uh, so that uh, soothes one of those problems over. Interesting story on National uh, Public Safety Minister Bill Blair at the time and all the China interference. Well, it doesn't seem like he was overly interested in being briefed and in fact worked dozens and dozens of days at home and, uh, and didn't bother reading the briefings. That's uh, some of the allegations being heard at the uh, uh, Chinese uh, interference uh, uh, commission. So. It sure isn't amazing, you know, see no evil, hear no evil among the liberal senior members when it comes to this. I oh, mean. it's crazy, isn't it? They obviously don't want to know. Uh, you mentioned Hurricane Milton. We've got a really good 3D visualization of what's going to happen when uh, the storm surge hits today. And uh, eesh, I wouldn't want to be, uh, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near it. And I'll just mention a column by Arlinda Slobodian. Uh, uh, Pierre Polyev was silenced yesterday and not allowed to ask questions in the parliament uh, question period, believe it or not, all because he said some nasty things about Melanie Jolly. And uh, Linda's got her take on that. And uh, you don't have to guess too far to say, figure out what it's going to be, Corey. No, I love uh, how Linda rips into those issues. She's fantastic. Oh, Linda, so. Once she gets her claws into it, she's like a crazy cat lady. <laughs> yes. But we're not, not Sorry, just Linda, an embittered... I don't mean you're a crazy cat lady. <laughs> all right. Well, Lots to cover and lots going on. I appreciate the check-in and uh, the reminder of last weekend's Steeler game. My pleasure. All right. That is our news editor, Dave Naylor, and that's when I like to remind you all. Uh, just, it's a sign from Jim Bryson who says, Kim Trails are real. You're liars. I just unsubscribed. You traitors. Oh, Jim, that's just the chemicals talking. Stop. Look, guys. <laughs> For those who want sane news coverage and real things, check out WesternStandard.News. is $9.99 a month, $100 a year, guys. And uh, yes, you know what? We do have columnists who will give a little more credence to those things, but I'm not going to be one of them. And uh, this is how we do stay independent 
of control from the federal government or anybody else. We do stay accountable to you. So I guess if my chemtrails comments upset enough people, we'll have lost enough subscribers that perhaps we shouldn't talk about it anymore. But I'm not going to stop at this point. Check it out, guys. If you've subscribed already, we do appreciate it. Uh, sorry to have lost your business, Jim. Uh, I uh, hope that uh, we can regain it once the chemtrail issue has been resolved. Uh, until then, the rest of you guys, you know, Thank you for subscribing. And if you haven't yet, get on board, guys. There's lots going on out there. Uh, yeah, the House of Commons these days, you know, always a, a gong show. I, listening, I mean, the Liberals are, are, are so hard on the rocks right now. They're in such dire straits and trouble that uh, it has become dysfunctional. I mean, it's a complete mess. I, I don't know what the point of keeping this this parliament alive anymore any longer is. I mean, people talk about um, Jagmeet Singh. You know, he's the one holding it up. I mean, he's a coward. I, I like uh, saying that on X all the time. I call him Jagmeet the Weak. It works them up, but it's it's true because he talks big, but he's a toothless tiger. And when it comes push comes to shove, he won't call an election. We're in a really bad state. we got a minority government that's sitting at like 20% support, but they are entrenched. We can't get them the heck out of there because of our rotten system. Canada's system is broken. You know, I've said it many times. So we've got a, a supposed, um, uh, you know, democracy going on, but we can't manage to invoke with it when we get such a minority government with so many people against it. Uh, and Jack me Singh, you know, people say that, oh, he's just in it for the pension and that. The guy already has his Rolexes and his $6,000 suits. I mean, I'm sure he'd like the pension, but that's not at all that's holding it. The problem that he's having there, actually, for the most part, is uh, uh, they got no money. They don't have any money. The, the, what is it? The, the NDP has something like $300,000 sitting in the bank. I believe the Conservatives have $16 million. Elections are expensive. You need a lot. And uh, the NDP, just if an election was called, they would be devastated. They wouldn't be able to buy ad space. They wouldn't be able to get campaign signs. Uh, but, so we've got the liberals terrified of an election. We've got the NDP terrified of an election. And then we've just got this. They're just not even hiding the premise of bias. I mean, Speaker Fergus, Ferguson is just terrible. He's just terrible. So, uh, yeah, for the, the spat with Angela, uh, or Angela. With Melanie Jolie there. She's our uh, foreign affairs minister, our terribly embarrassing one. Uh, Polyev was was shut out of the, the parliament for it. Like, and she called him a Nazi. She tried to tie him to Diagalon. Uh, uh, Diagalon's a flaky online internet group that, uh, you know, they, they, they hold some crazy views. Some say they're trolls. Some say they're real. I've seen some of their stuff. I think they really are. There, there's some really offensive, uh, weird, nasty people among them. But whatever. There, there's nothing much to them. But either way, that group, I mean, they posted about raping Polyev's wife. And Jolly is going to get up there and say that Polyev is actually supporting that group? Come on, guys, get real. Uh, it, it's bizarre. And yeah, paradoxy saying, yeah, from the parliament that literally honored a Nazi, I do think I, I'm still going to lay that down when they stood up for that Nazi there to just a case of having a, a low degree of history knowledge and uh, poor organization. I'm certain if in hindsight, if they'd have realized they were bringing in somebody uh, from the Waffen SS, they probably would have said, you know, we're not going to have that fella in there. I don't think for the most part, they support Nazis, but they are so incompetent and stupid that they did manage to bring one in there and get the whole place to stand up and applaud them. And yeah, some people said also the conservatives got up and applauded the guy too. Yeah, that's what they do. And actually, if you look at some of the, the footage from that, you can see a few turn their eyes to the side saying, you, you, you know, their gears were turning. They were saying, wait a minute, the date, this guy was fighting against the Russians and he was in Ukraine. Oh, oh no. But, you know, you just kind of politely applaud and, and sit down and hope that nobody would notice. And no, it's the House of Commons. People noticed and it hit the fan. But our parliament has managed to get worse over the course of a year. The, the, the discourse has gone downhill and nothing is getting done. They are <laughs> just beyond handcuffed. And even if and when the time comes that we finally get rid of those liberals and we get the conservatives in, that's when people will really discover 
how actually broken our system is, intractable it is, because that's when the conservatives are going to find that they don't change a thing. And that's where my guest can really answer a whole heck of a lot on that. He's been on before. He's Dr. Michael Wagner. He's written a number of books, particularly on Western independence and other things. And he's got a new book out and an anniversary edition of another book out. So thanks for coming on to join me today, Michael. Thanks for having me, Corey. Can you hear me? I do. Yes. You're coming in nice and clear. Okay, great, because I didn't know if I needed a headset. So. <laughs> no, no, you're coming in good. Uh, so, yeah, I'll just start with that. You know, I've got your books in here as well. Uh, this is Time to Leave, Canada Cannot Be Fixed. And as I was saying, with the, the gridlock going on in Parliament right now, kind of shows a little bit of that, with the system being broken, you know, not not just the, the, the policies necessarily. And uh, your other book, I mean, this is a really nice look, and i got to give them back to Nigel now. He lent them to me so I could read them. But uh, a Canada Standing on Guard for the a really nice-looking book, uh, and it's your 18th anniversary of this one. So uh, both interesting reads. So uh, with, with the time to leave, I mean, you've written, I'll let you explain it. You've written on uh, independence and sort of implied that it's time to leave for a while anyways. What's new in this one to uh, make the case a little better to people? Yeah, well, I, I wrote my book, uh, No Other Option, in 2021 as to present my case for independence. Like I'd written a history of the Alberta independence movement in 2009 called Alberta separatism then and now, but that wasn't an advocacy book so much, at least not explicitly, more subtly. So in 2021, I wrote No Other Option to make the explicit case for Alberta independence. And I found a lot of people were sympathetic, but so many people would say to me, you know, Alberta should become independent, but first we need to try to reform Canada. And well, after we've tried to reform Canada, if that doesn't work, uh, then we'll try to become independent. But but for me, that was a frustrating uh, argument because so much of our history for the last 40 or 50 years has showed how we have tried to reform Canada and it didn't work. And we, we've tried everything reasonable so far. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I wasn't expecting to write another book advocating Alberta independence, but I, I really had to counter the argument that we still need to try to reform Canada because there are many things I talk about in Time to Leave in more detail than in No Other Option that show we've tried to reform Canada. And like the two biggest uh, uh, ways in which we tried to do that was, you know, number one, the Reform Party and number two, the Senate reform. And we started on Senate reform, you know, in, in the late by late 1970s. So there are things we worked on for that many good Albertans worked on for many, many years and, and they didn't, they were not successful. And so I'm saying, you know, we, we have tried to reform Canada. And since none of these efforts we've tried over the decades have worked, we really have to go now for the independence referendum. That's the only thing we have left that we haven't tried. And, you know, when I talk about Senate reform and the reform party, these people did the best. Like, uh, it's not a matter of we can do these again and do better. We can't. We had the very best people, you know, in the reform party and, and advocating Senate reform. And if our very best people cannot achieve it, you know, doing their very best, then, you know, it's, it's, those are not viable options for us. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, it's a system that that's broken and central Canada benefits from the system. So they do not re want it reformed. And so our only, the only thing we have left now is the independence referendum. And so, so the time to leave is different from no other option in the sense that it really focuses specifically on, you know, showing how we've tried so many things that haven't worked. That's kind of the main theme of the book. And so, you know, the, all these books cover the same time period in a sense, because, you know, uh, you know, from the 1970s up until now, but, but they, they're not covering, they're, they're using, they're, it's, there's different information. So you're not, if you buy one of the, two of the books, you're not getting the duplicated information that way. No, and, and I understood that, you know, in reading it, but I figured the best for you to explain that so people don't realize you didn't just slap a new cover on an old book and, uh, and sell it again. It, there, there's something different and a different approach to things in the new ones. So. I appreciate that. And then uh, I saw you recently at the, at the Ted Byfield uh, uh, event in Edmonton. And of course, you know, he, he was an, an amazing Albertan. And, uh, uh, you know, he came from elsewhere in Alberta, but he, he established himself here. And a little while ago, I read uh, actually uh, uh, Ted Byfield, one of his books. And, and uh, it, it reminded me once I, I read your, you know, standing on guard for the on uh, the unapologetic social conservative and Christian stance, which is, is fine. And, and I was really fascinated with it. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Not so much on the, I mean, we will talk a bit about the content of your book, but you see, where somebody like myself, I'm, I'm very much not on the socially conservative side or, or, or a person of faith, but we have a big commonality in supporting individual freedom. And that's how we can sit in the same room and, and, and respect each other. And, and if we could fix the system, that's how we could all be satisfied. Like there is a way. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, for me, you know, I write about, um, as you mentioned, that that book that's being redone, that's about um, Christian political activism in Canada. 
and one of the main people in that, like there's three key people I, I uh, identify in that, and one of them is Ted Byfield. And then when I write about Alberta independence topics, very often the key person again is Ted Byfield. Like he he really um, brings together both of those elements. But yeah, I mean, uh, like well, there's a there's a term I've used in in one of my other books that I call Byfield conservatism, and Byfield conservatism is you know there's three principles to it. One is free enterprise economics, you kind of libertarian side of things. Uh, one is, um, you know, defense of Western regional interests. And one is uh, defense of, you know, social conservative ideas like traditional morality. But, you know, so those are kind of the bedrock ideas of what I call Byfield conservatism, which is in a sense, Alberta conservatism. But yeah, there, there is so much in common in terms of the individual freedom thing, as you mentioned. And, and you know, that's why, you know, say a party like the UCP has elements of both and they can work together, you know, um, in terms of uh, like opposing the NDP, right? So, yeah, and I mean, I think that the common enemy we always have is authoritarianism. Whether it's it's right or left, if it's too far, then then we can't stay in the room. Then we start fighting with each other, and that's how we start spinning our wheels. I, I saw just today yet another one of those common type of court challenges. It was down in the states; it's been going for years. I guess somebody had demanded a, I think it was in Colorado, a trans cake, a, a cake, you know, uh, to celebrate. Uh, his transition to a, a new gender. You know, the court threw it out, finally. Can't we have both sides? Can you not just say, this is a grown adult and, and he or she can transition to whatever the heck they please and, and, and go with what they will, but this is also a private business owner and if they don't want to provide this, go to another bakery. Like, it, it should be that simple, but the far end on both sides are saying, well, you shouldn't be allowed to do that as a grown adult. And the other side is saying, you shouldn't be allowed to do that as an independent business owner. And I think both are wrong. Yeah, like, I think that's an important point you make there because, you know, a lot of the um, elements of, I would term broadly the sexual revolution and this particular, you know, say the gay rights element, a lot of it was originally proposed as a libertarian idea let people live their lives as they want and do what they want. And there's, and, and that gets support because that makes so much sense to so many people. You live the way you want. Let me live the way I want. And we can get along together that way, right? In society. But you have the examples like you brought up. Here's a Christian businessman who does not want to participate in certain, uh, you know, baking a cake for certain activities or, or certain identities. And yet um, they go after him. Like once they realize that he won't, you know, a number, he's got a number of these cases that have happened because people go directly to him deliberately to cause him trouble because they want to force him to embrace their, their way of, of doing things. Now, if they would like back off from that and say, well, he's, he's got his views. We'll let him live according to his views. He can do that and we'll do our thing. You know, uh, we'd have a lot more peace in society if, if people were that way. You know, that that's the original libertarian thing. You live your way and I'll live mine. You know, that does provide a good basis, but, um, but it's so hard for many people to accept that. You know, when they see someone who doesn't agree with them, they want to, for some reason or other, take action to to shut that down or to force some kind of conformity. And, you know, we see a lot of the, right now, because the progressives are, are, are in power to one degree or another, they want to enforce conformity. Like we saw that with the NDP and the Christian schools. You know, if uh, uh, Rachel Notley's government was going to shut down some Christian schools because they were unwilling to adopt certain uh, pro-LGBTQ policies. And if it wasn't for Jason Kenney being elected in 2019, you know, that would have gone ahead. And it's it's because, you know, the progressives and, and probably people on the right too, to some degree, have this thing that you must live according to what I believe. And if you don't, then the government's going to make you do it. You know what I mean? So so that libertarian ideal is, is so much better in the sense of allowing people just to live their own lives and not interfere with other, what other people are doing in their own business. Well, yeah, and school choice, I mean, it's such an integral part of the whole thing because I, I think that's where a lot of people, they, they have their different views. They want their children educated with values that sh they share. And, and right now, they're not leaving the public system to be a generic then reading, writing, and arithmetic institution. They're putting in woke values into these institutions that a lot of parents differ with. People should have the choice then to put their children into a different place. And that shouldn't be controversial. Uh, but it is, unfortunately. I, I mean, you know, what's wrong with a Christian school? If you don't like it, don't go there. <laughs> but uh, do, do you talk? I don't believe so. But I mean, you know, a voucher system. These are the things we could explore with a new system. Like we could really bring about some things where we can allow those freedoms and choice. 
Yeah, well, actually, uh, this is one of the areas of, of, of lots of interest to me, even though it's not in the Standing on Guard for the book, um, the idea of education, because my wife and I, we've home educated right from the very beginning. Like we, we've we been firmly in that. And so in graduate school, actually, my kind of my area of expertise was on, on school choice in Alberta to some degree. So th this is a very important issue. You know, the progressives like to talk about diversity, but then when it comes to school, it's one size fits all. And, and the the, the ideas that you're talking about, educational choice, that is genuine diversity. You know, you've got your public schools, charter schools, which are a kind of public schools, different kinds of independent schools, home education. The more options people have is the more genuine diversity you have and the more you actually um, serve the needs of the people. Like there's different kinds of families with different views. And um, when you have this kind of educational choice, like a vast amount of educational choice, that serves the families where they're at. If they want to go to public school, there's probably one right down their road. If they want a more specialized charter school, maybe they can find one, especially if they're in a big city. You know, if, they, if there's a, the, a kind of private school that they want, there's there's lots of different kinds of ones, uh, you know, in Alberta, you know, partially depends on where you live and, and things like that. And then home education, you can do that in any part of the province. And then even within home education, um, there's like there's different degrees to which you can you can follow the government curriculum or you can follow a different curriculum or you can do what some people call unschooling where you just kind of let the children you know follow their own interests to whichever degree but but there's so much like this is a real libertarian uh, success story educational choice that people can choose what's best for their family for their children and they don't even have to choose one and stick with it you know if they can try something that's not working for their kids like a lot of people in home education you know first sent their kids to school and the school didn't work for them and so they can bring this ch child home and work with the child home like there's just so much opportunity there and, so, and the more freedom there is the more di genuine diversity there is and the better the needs of the families and children are served well, absolutely. And I mean, one of the areas getting outside of the social conflict and things like that is different children's do respond differently to different types of education. Some kids are, are really well geared for a hands on. They could be a fantastic mechanic or, uh, you know, or a, a tradesperson or something like that. But in the public school, they treat that as if it's a, uh, not a decent trade or they say that's where we stick the troublesome kids. Well, no, actually. And, and perhaps if those children were put into the schools that they're better uh, accustomed to, they could be even better mechanics, even better uh, electricians and such, and they'll do very well for themselves. But you need to give that choice to apply to the different kids. As you said, we're, we're trying to stuff everybody into the same bowl and, and it's harming all of them. Yeah, and you know, uh, just as an example of that, and this is something I, I think I've experienced in my own life is like boys in particular develop uh, a little bit slower than girls do, uh, you know, academically. And some boys at certain ages, you know, are not ready to read. Like in, in, we think in education, well, at a certain age, every child should be reading at a certain level. You know what I mean? But some boys develop slower. And, and uh, like, I think I was that way. Cause I remember in grade two, I was taken out of class to read with some um, new Canadian children. I was probably wasn't very good. So when, when I was, I was forced to learn to read too early. And so uh, boys that are learn, learn, forced to read too early, learn that reading is hard. That's one of the messages they get. And they learn that they don't like reading. You know what I mean? And later on, reading became one of my favorite things. But but for many years, I didn't like reading. And I think it was because it was pushed on me too early. You know what I mean? I wasn't quite ready for it. And I think that's true for many boys. You know, I've heard that before. Well, this boy, he's, he's not reading up to his level and you, you, want, you want to shove it down his throat. And he's not going to like reading if you do that. You know what I mean? Or if you let oh, them yeah. develop at their own level when they're ready, uh, then they then they will like it because they're ready for it. And there's a few gifts better than literacy. Um, I'll, I'll kind of start closing to a, a good qu question from one of the commenters. It kind of puts you on the spot. Maybe you don't have to come up with all five, but it's a good question. Peter LaFontaine, you know, taking it back towards the independence front, uh, saying, can, can your guest list five key policies that most Albertans would want and agree on? And, uh, you know, kind of then what we don't have, though, without separation. Like, what are we being held up from then in the current system? Well, I think that like the number one thing would be economic development that we could do on our own. Um, you know, the climate change policies that, as a trying sorry, climate change policies of the Trudeau government, you know, hamper our economic development. So um, I think Albertans would uh, agree uh, for the most part on the need for um, having a robust uh, development of our uh, natural resources, especially our energy, energy resources. And I think we could do much better independently than under J uh, Justin Trudeau and the Canadian government. Um, I don't know if I can do five. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's fine. I just I present I just present independence as an independent Alberta. Albertans get to decide our future. You know what I mean? Like right now, the way system the system is, um, people essentially, you know, 
generally speaking, in Ontario and Quebec, they elect the government and they decide what, what is best for Alberta, you know, in terms of the federal responsibilities. And so they make these kind of policies like climate change or, you know, uh, trying to restrict uh, freedom of expression on the internet. And I could, you know, if I had time, I could probably think of others. And th these are not policies favored by Albertans. These are favored by people, I say, in Toronto and Montreal, where, you know, so many of the votes come from that uh, elect this, the government there. So if we had our own government here in Alberta, the people who run the province uh, would govern the province in accordance with the desires of Albertans and not in the accordance with the desires of people in Toronto and Montreal. Like they'd have to, we would be electing our own leaders and our own leaders would do what we want or else we'd get rid of them. Right now, as it is, um, we hope that Justin Trudeau will, will lose the election uh, next year, but it's not up to us. Like we we're always voting against him anyway. It's up to people in Ontario and Quebec to put him out. But so our destiny is outside of our own control. Like this is a democracy. We're supposed to be able to elect the people that, you know, make these decisions for us and our own destinies in our own control. That is only possible for an independent country because right now our destiny is controlled by people who are elected in, you know, Toronto and Montreal, Ottawa, that kind of area for the most part. Yeah. And I mean, just, it's just that localized decision-making alone. I mean, then we could, we could spend a lot of time talking about the different individual policies. The, the main thing is that using independence as a catalyst to be able to rebuild that system. Um, so yeah, the, the time went quickly. And before I let you go, you know, these are the books, where can folks get out and get their copies and guys, it's worth it. Michael's writing is great. Okay, well, they're, they're going to be available on Amazon. There's actually pages for them on Amazon. They're standing on guard for thee. You can pre-order it already. It's being released in uh, January 1st. Uh, time to leave. Um, it, there's a page for it on Amazon. The Kindle's available, but for some reason, Amazon is dragging its feet on getting the paper copies available. But at some point, Amazon should have them there, hopefully soon. Also, there's a local Alberta business it's called Merchant Ship. Their website is merchantship.ca. They will be carrying both books. Uh, hopefully, they'll soon have time to leave available there. I know they have copies. They just haven't had time to put it up on their website yet. Excellent. Well, I, I appreciate you coming in to talk again. It's been a while and uh, I, yeah, appreciate the writing and I hope folks rush out and get those. So uh, thanks again, Michael. And I, I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Thanks for having me. It's been great to talk to you. Great. Thank you. So that is Dr. Michael Wagner. And yes, he, he writes some great stuff, particularly on the independence front. And you know, if you Google his name and you Google some of those things, you will find your way to those copies and, and get them. They're uh, a good read. So, you know, getting on to the, the, the side of, um, like I said, in, in closing, I mean, I, I know it was good to ask for five, five responses, but it does put a person on spot and count them down. Uh, but we've got, when, when you accept that the system's broken, the structure, the constitution, the agreement, the contract, whatever way you want to call it, you know, getting into the geekery, think of Charlottetown and Meech Lake. That's the two last attempts to really kind of change the system. And they failed. They didn't even come close. So a province, whether it's Alberta or Quebec or whatever, I personally, anyways, I think the only catalyst that's going to shake the country up enough to inspire people to redraft the agreement will be an independence referendum. Nothing shy of that is going to change it. And it's something I've said to others before, I've said it in my book, uh, and I'm certain, you know, Michael uh, uh, feels much the same. It's liberals stir people up and, and help foster independence uh, sentiment. But it's when conservatives hoop us that people really have it entrenched. That's when they realize it's the system. That's when they realize the conservatives will be less bad, but they're still beholden to central Canada. And it's just math. It's not personal. If they want to stay in power, they have to keep Toronto and Montreal satisfied. And that's what creates the real independence advocates when they realize, wow, nothing's changing no matter what party I put in there. Now we got to start looking at the system. And one of the bigger fears, if we get to the point of an independence referendum and entrench a new system, we got to be careful. Humans can screw up. And hey, I hate to admit it, but we can screw up in the West too. We'd better make sure we put in a better system than the one we got out of because it's not impossible that we break free and we make something dumber and worse than what we used to have. And that's where a lot of debate and discourse can happen too. I, I, I see another one of the, the commenters there, uh, Saxon of Riverstone, saying Liber libertarian legal theory uh, insistence that the amount of government interve intervention should be kept to a minimum and the primary functions of law should be enforcement of contracts and social order. Yeah, that's a good kind of basic description. There's a lot of uh, disagreement or misunderstanding. I mean, people have different views of what they think libertarianism is. I, I, I like the word that was in that definition though of minimum. 
I, I, I don't believe we should have no government. I don't believe there should be no order. I, I don't like having too much entrenched bylaws in a local area. But I also understand if 100 houses are going to live in a district, you got to have a few rules. Uh, or you can have the guy next door opening a, a nightclub next to you on one side and a guy opening a tannery on the other side. And uh, between the, the, the leather smoke and the, and the partying, you're going to have to move. So we got to kind of like it or not come up with a few rules. I prefer a world where we speak to our neighbor directly rather than going running to the city if you have a dispute. It's a much better way to do things typically. But we need a degree of laws. I mean, some people say libertarians, so who's going to build the roads? Well, I'm not talking about anarchy. I'm not talking about zero government. I just want as little government as possible. And that'll always be debatable on what the minimum is. Always. Is pushing back and forth. But as long as we've got a good democracy, we can discuss those things. We can change those things. That's part of the worry. That's part of the problem is we can't change it. We, we don't want to make our system so easy to change that we're constantly in flux. But currently, we've got one that's carved in granite. We can't do anything with it. We can't change the Constitution. We can't even tweak it. So we can't flex to different policies or outlooks. And, and it leads to uh, just... To, to the disaster we got. Look at, look at Parliament. What a waste of time is going on there. But can we ignore Parliament and just go our way provincially? Well, no, unfortunately, because the federal government has so much control over our laws, as, as, as Dr. Wagner was saying, whether it's economically with uh, our resource development and, and exports and carbon taxes and things like that, we can't just ignore them and do our own thing because there's a constant battle with them. All right, I'm going to pivot a little. Uh, some folks are watching social media and those who haven't, or if you're watching the standard, Jared Jagger, he's been our, our guy in BC. He's been covering the BC election. He's a young fella. He's been really good. And he went out the other night in Vancouver on the ground. And that's the difference. That's why I talk about subscribing to the standard and supporting us, even if you get upset with me and my chemtrail stuff. Don't forget, there's lots of us here. and Not everybody uh, uh, has to agree on everything. That's what I mean. There's some of that. Let's talk about binary and being non-binary. Binary thinking. Either everybody there has to write what I like or I'm not subscribing. Well, then the problem is yours. You know, you can read the dozens and dozens of people who write and put things up on the Western Standard and don't click on mine. It's okay. It's easy. You can do that. There's lots of different views. When you draw a line in the sand and say, it's either all that way or I'm out the door, well, then get the hell out the door. Don't let it hit your ass on the way out. I mean, I'm not going to pander to everybody who gets upset because they don't agree with me on everything. Guys, if you agree with me on everything, you're cult members. You aren't readers. So we're allowed to disagree. So either way, Jared gets on the ground. He went out to the protests uh, in Vancouver in person. And man, the, the thing that really impressed me when he's posting him, he's actually a really good photographer too. We're talking some high level, excellent images he was sharing on there and video that went, went viral across the country because unfortunately our legacy media wasn't really there covering it. And what we had was the shield fully fell off on the, the pro-Hamas, pro-terrorist activists we're seeing on our streets and uh, you know they've been pretending all this time we're freedom fighters we're we're doing this for palestine we don't hate the jews they didn't even pretend anymore i mean when you're out on october 7th when you're out on the anniversary of one of the most horrific disgusting terror attacks in human history when a music festival was targeted young women were picked up raped tortured murdered hundreds were kidnapped 1,200 murdered, whatever side of the issue you're on, unless you're inhuman and those people protesting are, you should be disgusted by that tactic in attacking innocent people in Israel. And October 7th was the anniversary of it. And to go out there waving your little Palestinian flags and your terrorist flags and your Hezbollah flags. And these are the words, these are the quotes, and that's where I really appreciate Jared got it on video. Because people just don't believe it. These are the things they were chanting. We are Hamas. We are Hezbollah. Now, these are both registered, known terrorist entities. It's not opinion whether or not they're terrorists. They are terrorists. Every developed country in the world calls those entities terrorists. And that's what these guys are saying. We are Hamas. We are Hezbollah. Death to Canada. Canada. Watch the videos. Watch what Jared put out there. And it's funny. I read a CBC. Yes, the state broadcaster. I read a lot. I have to read a lot of that stuff, whether I like it or not, to have a broad point of view when I bring my stuff out to you guys. And the CBC used some of Jared's pictures, actually, in their article, and they credited him with it. And they even said along the line, we haven't independently verified the video taken, but a CBC reporter was in the area who did say that, yes, indeed, they did say we are Habas, we are Hezbollah, death to Canada. So, yes, even the CBC kind of had to almost grudgingly admit that that's what these guys were chanting out there. How much more are we going to put up with? 
They're all masked. They're smashing windows at universities. They're terrorizing Jewish neighborhoods. I, I mean, again, they kept saying it's Zionists. You know, they, they love using that term, it's Zionist, Zionist, Zionist. If you're just substituting, <laughs> substituting a word for Jew. And if it had been anything else, the law would have stepped in by now. They would have said that's enough. If this had been, because these guys all wear masks. Funny, you know who else did? Clan members. Yeah. You know, if you really believe in your cause, why do you have to hide your face? Huh? Why are you such a coward? Why you got to always hide behind a mask? Sunglasses in the works. Because you know you're wrong. Because you know you're scum. And you are. When you're celebrating the slaughter of girls at a music festival, you're wrong. You know, some people say that not every issue is black and white. Some of them are. And celebrating that is the same as celebrating on September 11th for the, the, the blowing up of the, the, the World Trade Center. And uh, it, it, it's old. And we can't keep letting this slip. We wouldn't put up with a bunch of Klan members out there marching on the streets saying it's time to get rid of the black population in Canada, would we? No, of course not. We would say that. We don't put up with that in a civilized country. That's where I'm talking about the balance between, yes, and rights. It's not always easy. You know, you want free expression. You want to let people, even if their views are a little offensive, fine. But there's a line that gets crossed. When it comes to incitement of violence, when it comes to actually trying to promote hatred, yes, we draw that line and we do have charges. And this, when you're saying death to Canada, yes, you've crossed the line. You're inciting hatred. You're asking to kill people. And you know what? Eventually one of these nuts will. Maybe a few of these nuts will. The time to intervene is now. The time to intervene was actually months ago. But meanwhile, we've got Jolie and, and, and uh, Polya fighting in Parliament over this because Melanie Jolie, for whatever reason, is afraid to condemn these savages. And then the Speaker of the House, who's pretty much owned by the Liberal Party, is embarrassing the office of Speaker, stops Polya from speaking about it because he feels it's offensive. Or no, the bottom line was he was owning a Liberal minister because Jolie is really not the sharpest knife in the drawer. So let's just stop him from asking her any more questions. And, uh, you know, there was the flag burning that happened. They burned a bunch of Canadian flags at this protest uh, in Vancouver the other day. And, you know, see, there's one of the areas where I, I, I mix. I think flag burning is offensive. I think it's ugly to look at. I don't think it should be illegal. Calling for death to Canada is the problem. Saying that we are Hamas, we are Hezbollah is the problem. That is is illegal. That's spreading hate. That's promoting violence. That's what we got to step in and say that's enough because it spreads. So I, I went in Calgary last weekend to uh, uh, at City Hall, the, the, the Calgary, you know, supporters for, for Israel or people concerned anyways, uh, you know, just had a like a, a calm memorial event at City Hall for the victims and people of October 7th. Again, it wasn't a uh, thing to demand that Israel uh, attack or blow anything up. They just wanted to hold a memorial for the people who are still held hostage and the ones who have already been killed by, the, by these terrorists. So what do the pro-terrorist group do? They set up across the street and they gave their kids and they had a bunch of kids. That's the thing these scumbags I get sick of too. They put their kids in the front all the time and they gave their kids bullhorns and the kids were screaming in the bullhorns throughout the entire ceremony on the other side where the, the, the Jewish community was peacefully trying to hold, you know, a vigil. Really? Yes, there's a right and a wrong side. The ones who stick their children out spewing hate, screaming at people who are trying to hold a peaceful vigil, they're on the wrong. You don't have to sit here and parse this and think about it too bloody long. It was disgusting. It was disgusting when this was going on in Montreal and Toronto as well. And we've got to step up. And that's when you do cross a line between, you know, and, and, and there's no pacifying these nutcases. There's none. I, they, they went and they attacked the CBC uh, uh, studios in Vancouver the other night. The CBC, that's the most, uh, you know, sympathetic media ear you idiots have. But it's not good enough for them. It's never good enough for them. These are people overwhelmed with hate. These are people overwhelmed with anger. See, with paradoxy, and I fully agree, saying I think it's awful when people take their kids to any protests or, or, or demonstrations. It's bad parenting, absolutely. Uh, whether Even if it was a, a conservative-leaning demonstration or protest, if it seemed at all it's going to get uh, violent or hateful, you just don't take the kids there. Don't. Don't. And I was watching, and I was watching those kids screaming and listening to them screaming. I posted some videos on X. You could hear them on, on the videos I posted. 
These are little kids right now that are getting programmed to such anger, to such hate. And I said earlier, you know, when we hear later on, when somebody's 18, 20 years old, whatever, they go off the rails and they go on a shooting rampage or they bomb something or they blow something up. And people say, how did that ever happen? This is how right now. This is how we're seeing it happen. We're seeing the children being programmed and trained into extremism and violence when they're just little. We're talking, I was talking like eight, 10 years old, these ones that were holding these bullhorns, screaming hate at, at, at people just trying to hold a vigil. We've got to stop this. We are better than this. We're supposed to be a civilized country and these people are not acting in a civilized way. So you know what? And that's something that gets to me and there's truth to it and people are getting upset but too bloody bad. When the masks are ripped off of these people standing out there screaming and burning Canadian flags and saying death to Canada, if they aren't citizens, deport them right away. Get the hell out. You want death to Canada? Get the hell out of here. We don't need you. We don't need you. In fact, we really want you gone. And if they are Canadian citizens, charge them. And then the ones at the university the other day too that were smashing all the windows while a bunch of students linked arms to block authorities from stopping the smashing, expel every single one of those clowns. And if they aren't citizens, deport them. We got a lot of people in this world who would love to come to Canada, live peacefully, raise their families, make a living, contribute, network with neighbors. Millions of people want to do that. And right now we can only fit so many because we've got all these scumbags taking up space and chanting death to Canada at these protests. No, we got to stand up for ourselves, guys. This is why Canada's weak. If you don't like independence movements, people like me and Mr. Wagner pushing these sorts of things, if you want to instill some pride in Canada so guys like me and Mr. Wagner don't end up spreading the independence sentiment, then bring about some pride in Canada. Part of the pride is having a civilized country that's going to stand up against pro-terrorist types of people, hate-spewing people, and say, we do not allow that here. Go somewhere else if you're going to do that. We don't need it. You're out. All right. That's enough ranting out of me. Be sure to tune in to the pipeline tonight, guys. We're going to have Jared on, actually. He's going to chat for a little while, as well as Chris Oldcorn. He's covering the election in Saskatchewan. Uh, watch Nigel Henfer. He actually uh, interviewed the uh, ambassador to Israel the other day, and there's a video of that up. His show is fantastic. It always is. And again, get to the Western Standard. Get your news there. Subscribe. Support us. Thank you very much. Don't let the chemtrails get you in the night. I appreciate you tuning in, and I'll see you all next week at this time.